Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Very happy to see you all and to wish you welcome to this session focusing on women at the forefront in reducing violence and gun-based violence in particular. We've got a great panel that I'm going to introduce you to very soon. But let me start first by basically drawing up the background. We know that there are thousands of people being killed by guns every year. We know that a good proportion of them are women. We know that thousands more of women are injured, intimidated, harassed by, by people holding guns in their hands. We are used to seeing women as victims of violence. This workshop, this seminar is focusing on women at the forefront of addressing the problem, building peace, reducing gun violence, and focusing on small arms control. We are focusing on women at the forefront. Now, there's a lot of networks that have been built in order to empower women, build strength, build the networks in order to exchange experiences and focus on building power for these women networks over the past few years. And we think these networks are crucial in order to mobilize more women in small arms control. We are together with the German Foreign Office um, partnering around gender and small arms network, which is one of these networks. And we'd like to appeal to everyone online here actually to get involved in being part of this broad new movement of guns control, small arms control. We need more women at the forefront. Our aim here in this seminar is to bring together women who are actually mobilizing for the issues and make the women at the forefront more visible in the whole battle that we are standing in. We know that gender-based violence has increased dramatically during the pandemic. We know that arms sales has gone up dramatically also in parts of the world. So the problem is getting bigger and the issues and spillovers from the pandemic are not over. We will see socioeconomic challenges also probably mobilizing challenges and raising challenges in the areas of violence and small arms control in the future. So we need more people on board. We have got four fantastic women in this panel. I'm going to introduce them one by one, but let me just introduce the whole uh, group first. We've got Sanja Sumonja, who is going to address us later. We've got Ilva Elman, Magda Cross, and Josephine Alabi, uh, representing a fantastic group of women at the forefront from different parts of the world. We are going to start actually with a few words of Magda Cross, who is the founder of the civil society organization 24-0 in Mexico. And Magda, you are going to address the issues from a Mexican perspective, understanding the challenges of gender-based violence and small arms control with a Mexican perspective. Please go ahead, Magda. Thank you very much for the introduction, Liv. I would like to start by thanking Pat Finders and Jansak for the invitation for this very relevant workshop with the UN SGD Action Campaign. 
I believe that these are the issues that we have to address, and this is very necessary that we bring to, into the global discussion. It is important because gun violence continues to haunt us every day. Just in the USA, we have been seven shootings in seven days, Georgia on March 16, California the next day, Oregon, then Houston, Dallas, Philadelphia, and finally the attack in the supermarket in Colorado. I send my condolences to all the families of the victims. This is an opportunity to raise awareness on the urgency of the stronger regulation of gun ownership. As you may know, uh, nine of each 10 victims of gun violence are male, but they are also are the great majority on the gun, of the gun legal owners and 95% of the persons who commit a crime. These statistics are global, but Latin America continues to be the deadliest region in the world regarding gun violence. In Mexico, six women are killed each day with guns. 58% of the women killed in Latin America are victims of femicide. Gun makes this kind of extreme violence by, uh, a lot more easier. Uh, there is another problem, the disproportionate risk for women in households with guns, because in general, they are not the gun owners. And they also rarely have an opinion regarding the presence of guns in their homes. Even if they are not the culprits of this violence, women are especially affected by gun violence, as you said, because of femicide, domestic violence, streets, forced migration, sexual assault, and other sorts of violence that are linked to the presence of guns. We all understand this problem, but what we still need to grasp is the root of this problem. And that, as I have found, in, it is in a profound cultural system, a problem of how we understand masculinity. So today I want to talk about the link between masculinity and guns and how men are pushed to belong to a cultural global sense and establish a unique way of masculinity. This is why gender perspective on control policies can aim to prevent gender-based violence. Rita Segato, the Argentinian anthropologist, has explained the logic behind femicides and gender-based violence. She established that the origin of many other violences is the violence against women as a form to gain a place in the world of men, an, exhi an exhibition to gain respect among other men. Violence is a result of the search of power over, over others, more, more vulnerable and feminine. So it may be women, but also the others that represent the same prejudice and that are different to what represents the masculine mandate. Uh, to be white, to have economical power, to be straight, to be the head of the family, to be real men. Masculinity has to be proven constantly. It has a mandate to dominate or to be eliminated. This is a cultural call for violence, and this violence is generally expressed against women. This also happens with gun violence. A great majority, around 96% of those involved in shootings are male, most of them white. And they believe that through violence, they can reach a respect they, they, will, they deserve. It becomes a spectacle. And this is what we call privilege. Privilege cuts, cuts through gun violence and gender violence. It is a transversal problem. And this place that privilege has needs to be addressed. I believe that this may be a starting point to understand the problem. Guns let people show a power that they might think that they, but that, that they don't have. Small arms have a symbolic power that goes beyond violence, it's given you true greed. But also their presence in the public space limits the liberty of women with an oppressive power. They need not to be even in the present with sole treat of existence limits the freedom of women. Gun violence is not an isolated factor even, it is a flow because using a gun is in a, it's an extension of demonstrating this kind of toxic masculinity. We can see the same phenomenon inside security institutions. Most of them are socially constructed with a male dominated hierarchy filled with stereotypes that despise any feminine values. This allows us to see beyond an armed conflict and unravels a reality in which armed violence as a part of violence in general punishes everything that does not prove to be masculine enough. Women, men who do not fit in the role of the heterosexual men and who are not the ones with power. Therefore, they, they are the victims of the consequences of inequality. For years, 
Proliferation of guns has been approached as a national security issue. We know that gun proliferation can escalate conflicts from an interpersonal issue to a community conflict or even eventually into a situation of state violence. The presence of small arms when gangs or drug cartels fight usually increases femicide cases and other violence against women. In war, women are bounty. They are human shields and also a way to humiliate a rival. But the problem goes beyond armed conflict. Gun facilitates suicides, sexual harassment, domestic violence, among other violences. It is not only a political problem, it is a household problem, a personal problem. Testimonies of women have proven that gun violence is an ordinary situation something that can happen to anybody. Intimate partner violence, women that cannot walk alone in the communities or neighborhood, therefore they cannot go to work safely and their rights for education or economic autonomy are belittled. The use of militarization to keep so-called safe zones where women still do not feel safe when men with assault weapons are around the places where they get water or supplies. Gun violence is not just state security agenda is it, it is an equality between men and women agenda. The, <clears throat> the absence of women as decision makers in security fields and the invisibilization of their work and opinions in peace building are, uh, and gun control policies have been very difficult to establish an effective gun violence prevention global program. And this, this brings me to the main point. We, as women, have been historically excluded from the policy building on gun control. There are plenty of moments in the stages of the life cycle of small arms where female perspective is relevant for its control. Women are usually excluded from all those processes. A good example of where we should be included is very simple. Both partners in a relationship should have to agree to have a gun in a household. This is a proven good practice in many countries. But women can participate also in the public policy regarding the appropriate storage of guns, as well as gun, as gun legal transferences. This is where many of the smuggling and loss of weapons goes to the black market. market. The, UN, uh, the UN has been clear that when women's inclusion in peace building process is essential for long-term success, gender equal participation contributes to longer and last peace after con con conflict. <clears throat> Despite the strong evidence in favor of our inclusion, women remain largely invisible and sidelined from formal peace process and negotiation. According to the UN statistics, lasting peace in which women intervene has more than 30 times the chance of being maintained over time. The importance of having more women on the issue of small arms control and disarmament, as many women leaders have demonstrated, is that they put as a priority saving lives. When faced with war, women care more about pacification and protection. But in terms of gun control, their approach is for, of great value. Is this, is the, this vision that must be promoted and given priority on the national and international agenda. It is necessary to consider yeah. the views of women, their experience, perspective, and capacity to transform in an integral way regarding gun control policies. So, To end my participation in national and, and international process of disarmament, giving them a voice and a role, but also helping them to build the alliances to act and make decisions. Because the toxic masculinity and its link with guns and violence hurts women, but also dis disrupts men's lives. They are also a victim of the mandate of, of masculinity that pushes them into gender-based violence. Together, we can turn it around. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Magda. Now, the challenges are enormous, as uh, Magda highlighted, but also the gains massive if more people get involved in controlling and reducing gun violence. Now, Ilva, you are the Director of Programs and Development for Elman Peace. You've heard Magda describe how the challenges are in Latin America and Mexico. And you see this from a youth perspective and from an African perspective. Please tell us how you think uh, the challenges are and how we need to get youth involved 
in addressing <clears throat> the problems. Please, Elva. Well, thank you so much, Liv. Um, really, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you may be joining us from. Thank you so much to Pathfinders and GenSAC and the SDG Action Campaign for organizing this event. To echo Magda, this is a timely event indeed. That comes at the end of Women's History Month, where all of March we've been celebrating significant advancements and barriers broken by women. Milestones certainly worth celebrating, but it's been a bittersweet period too, as the painfully slow progress we celebrate continues to be overshadowed by the global and sustained backlash against women's rights today. The withdrawal of Turkey from the Istanbul Convention on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence earlier just this week is another sad milestone. I'm joining you today from Mogadishu, Somalia, a country that has been ravaged by conflict my entire life, and in that period has almost become synonymous with small arms and light weapons. Yet the role of women in reducing gun violence and meaningfully engaging in disarmament is not a narrative often shed light on. After the fall of the Siadra regime and the disbanding of the Somali army in 1991, some 40,000 weapons were abandoned and channeled into clan militias. It was around this time that the now rarely talked about, but indigenous tradition of women's poetry for disarmament and peace building first took prominence. Poetry sung by Somali women with howling voices to end fighting and to support local micro disarmament initiatives were commonplace. But the first known Somali disarmament poem of which we are aware, composed at the time of independence, was by Khadija Musa Matan. I wanna share a few words with you before I continue. She said, I warn you, Somalis, disarm yourselves. Leave each other in peace. Your women mourn every sp spring while the vultures feast on your flesh. I warn you, Somalis, leave each other in peace. I believe Somalia is a key example for why local civil society, including women and youth, must be much closer involved into the disarmament policy and control, which currently is still dominated by intergovernmental and governmental discourse and approaches. In peaceful times, Somali women are responsible for hiding any weapon owned by the family so that no child or unauthorized person can misuse it. In this context, training, on, training women on gun safety measures can be expected to make a significant contribution to accident prevention in Somalia. But every coin has two sides. And during war times, women are often utilized to hand out the weapons, to mobilize resources for purchasing weapons, and recruiting fighters even. But even with this stark duality I've just presented you with, women face the greatest, the greatest risk of gun violence in places where violence levels are the highest. But they face even greater levels of threat as violence decreases. While women account for a minority of the victims of gun violence, they're most likely to die violently in countries and communities where violence is the highest. As countries become less violent, women make up the greater proportion of the victims of gun violence, largely because of the effects of gender-based violence. In some countries where homicide rates are among the lowest globally, women are more likely than men to be killed by firearms. The bodies of women and girls during war is the front line of conflict. Yet a global challenge in addressing this is that small arms and light weapons is not even explicitly included in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda even though a gendered approach to disarmament falls within the four pillars of the 1325 and WPS agenda, disarmament is not explicitly included in resolution 1325, except in the limited context of disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. We've just finished celebrating 20 years of 1325 and 25 years of the Beijing Declaration. Important tools, but the four pillars of women, peace and security, participation, protection, prevention and relief and recovery will never achieve the transformative potential of women's empowerment without the inclusion of disarmament within them. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda primarily emphasizes rape and sexual violence as a tactic of war and accountability through criminal justice. Recognizing the relationship between weapons and gender-based violence would open up the way for a fuller understanding, one that evolves beyond just victimization of women in times of war, but also gives them agency and access to influence weapons control and disarmament. Further compounding this challenge is how the security sector and government still look at WPS often as a soft engagement. Yes, there's a role for women in GBV in conflict prevention, but no, there's no need to include women in disarmament processes. 
I see and feel the limitations of this in my work at the Almond Peace Center every day. And the challenge is further compounded for young women from the global south working in the peace and security apparatus as we've become the poster, the poster child for spoils of war, the face you know best as victims, but rarely as negotiators, leaders, and facilitators of disarmament. To kick off this decade of action, we need to do business differently. To advance gendered approaches to DDR, we need to look at the full scope of small arms and light weapons and women. And this includes their leadership, their direct involvement in arms collection and preventative disarmament, the impact on women's lives, not only when they are survivors of GBV or victims of femicide, but also often overlooked the burdens of violence, such as long-term disability, mental health, and wider social consequences. And it also includes understanding the complex roles of women as active combatants in conflict, a limited understanding of which is only slowly evolving now after decades of conflict in Somalia. The UN General Assembly resolutions on WISP women, disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control have all called upon states to include women in national and regional coordination mechanisms related to disarmament and arms control. This also includes the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, with relevant goals and targets such as SDG 5.2 on eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls, and SDG 16.4 to reduce illicit financial and arms flow. The risk of GBV heightens in conflict situations, and it's estimated that about 45.6% of African women have experienced GBV as a result of armed conflict, compared to the 35% globally. It's estimated that most African women and girls have experienced a form of gender-based violence in their lifetime. In conflict context, gender-based violence is generally associated with armed groups and combatants who use small arms and light weapons to humiliate, intimidate, displace, and traumatize individuals and communities. For all those reasons and more, we at the Allen Peace Center are proud to be co-founding members of the Gender Equality Network for Small Arms and Controls, GENSAC, we are excited about the launch of the GENSAC initiative and humbled to serve our communities as the first focal point for East Africa, whether it's the advocacy, the exchange of best practices, or mutual support and protection. We know the invaluable contributions that strong knowledge and solidarity networks such as GENSAC can make. GENSAC is unique in how it brings a great variety of different stakeholders from grassroots civil society to government representatives together to promote gender inclusive arms control. Although women are often the most affected groups by illicit small arms use and smuggling, their role and potential contributions in controlling them is consistently overlooked. The diversity of this action-oriented GENSAC network, which we see mirrored also on today's panel, has brought civil society, police, and military, government experts together from across the globe to find joint solutions. It also provides a global platform and recognition to the exp ex exceptional expertise and experience of women all around the world so that we no longer ask the question of are women interested are women able to work along these issues but we get to highlight and profile women like my sister faith Lu luanga from south africa or asia mohammed who provides a fresh start for sgbv survivors in trinidad and tobago through her organization conflict women and it opens up critical dialogue opportunities with our colleagues from balkans and their experience in disarmament as well as partners, partners in Latin America, such as Carolina Ricardo or Pamela Romero, who are all leading such powerful fights against the raging femicides that are targeting women in their respective countries. Needless to say, women are defiantly, in the face of grave insecurity and little protection, working on disarmament and gun control, but they need further investments, support networks, and partnerships that promote meaningful inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilvan. We are very happy to have you here and as part of GENSAC, and not the least as a very active participant in the women's network uh, focusing on disarmament and small arms control. Now, I must, I must tell you, I'm sitting here looking at all of you and thinking about the the first woman prime minister in Norway, which is my background, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who once said that 
woman power is a formidable force. Um, and I think that is a very relevant point to pull out now when I look at you and when we address this topic. Women power is a formidable force. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Sandra Sumonia. She is the higher inspector of organized and serious crimes in the Ministry of Interior in the Republic of Srpska. Now, Sandra, you have particular knowledge and experience also about how to address this with a police woman perspective. Can you please bring in your experiences and share some of your views on how to take small arms control forward with a gender perspective? Please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Liu. I greet the distinguished representatives of international organizations and all the distinguished participants, as well as the listeners of this event. At the same time, I will take this opportunity to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this event. Since there is really a little time for presentation, I will use this time to share with you some numbers and to share with you some really good example and experience of one, I will dare to say, very successful women's police organization, the Women's Network of the Ministry of the Internal Affairs of Republic of Srpska. Extensive evidence produced as a result of the comprehensive research conducted by UNDPC SAC for the period from 2012 to 2016 provides augmented arguments of the highly gendered nature of small arms and the important role of the gender perspective in shaping and understanding various aspects of firearms ownership use and misuse, especially when it comes to gender-based violence. Besides, the recently released self surveys and gender and small arms fast fact series provide comprehensive insights into the specific context in each jurisdiction in the Western Balkans. And uh, some interesting data are as it follows. When it comes to firearms ownership and access to firearms, they are highly gendered. In Southeast Europe, men own 97.2 of all legally owned firearms, while only 2.8% is owned by women. When it comes to differentiated effects of firearms on women and men in Southeast Europe, armed violence is predominantly committed by men. From the period from 2012-2016, men committed 98.4 of all firearm-related criminal offenses in Southeast Europe. 98.5 of all firearm-related incidents and 98% of all firearm-related homicides. Violence committed by men is also age-related. Young men from 19 to 35 years are more likely to misuse firearms than men from other age groups. Men who misuse firearms most often misuse them in the criminal context and public dispute or argument. In Southeast Europe, men account for 83.8% of victims of firearm-related homicide compared to 16.2% of women. While men are more likely to misuse firearms than to fall victim of same, women are 10 times more likely to be a victim than perpetrators of firearm incidents. The pattern of women's victimization are predominantly related to use of firearms in domestic violence. When we speak about the misuse of firearms and domestic violence in Southeast Europe, domestic violence disproportionately affects women and family related homicides, homicide in the most common form of femicide in the region. 61% of all killed women in Southeast Europe 
were killed by a family member compared to 12.4% of all killed men. Women are at the particular risk of intimate partner violence. 38.6% of all killed women in Southeast Europe and 1.2% of all killed men in Southeast Europe were killed by an intimate partner. 36.5% of women killed by family member were killed with firearms, as well as 43.5% of women killed by an intimate partner. 37.4% of reported domestic violence incidents that involved firearms had a lethal outcome, making the misuse of firearms in domestic violence is more lethal than in any other type of incident. Despite this data indicated the widespread misuse of firearms in Southeast Europe, only 8.5% of rejected applications for the new license were rejected on the grounds of domestic violence. In addition, only 2.3 of all revoked firearms license were revoked due to the domestic violence. It's also, it is also very, very important to emphasize gendered aspects of demand uh, and misuse of firearms, masculinity and firearms. In Southeast Europe, men are two times more likely than women to say that would own a gun, 35.3% and 18.7% respectively. In addition, 52.9% of men perceive that having a firearm at home would make them feel safer and men from the youngest and oldest age our group uh, were more likely to state that they would own their own firearm. All these facts I mentioned highlights the linkage between small arms and violence against women. Having this in mind clears why there is a growing need for women to get involved in the front line of reducing gun violence. Since I'm a woman from security sector, I will emphasize the role of women police officers networking in this area for example, of network of women police officers I belong to. The Women's Network of the Ministry of Interior of Republic of Srpska was established in 2011 with the support of the UNDP CSAC program. We are registered as an NGO. One of the goals of founding our association is the comp contribution that women police officers can make to issues related to increasing the level of security of women in our region. Guided by these goals, during these 10 years, our women's network has implemented a number of projects that have mainly addressed issues based on gender-based violence. In the last few years, we have focused our activities on the issue of the misuse of weapons to the detriment of women, especially when it comes to gender-based violence. We have done a large number of trainings for our colleagues, police officers, students in school, teaching staff. We have written a number of brochures, manuals on gender-based violence, and some of them refer to the misuse of weapons in cases of gender-based violence. We also conducted some surveys among victims of domestic violence. We initiated the introduction of, that, of data on misuse of weapons in cases of domestic violence in the official stati statistics of our Ministry of the Interior. Unfortunately, the limited time does not allow me uh, to, take, to talk in more detail about this project, but thanks to them, our women's network has certainly become accepted as a serious and equal partner, not only in our region, but also beyond. We actively and equally cooperate with a really large number of domestic and international organizations on a wide range of issues related to women's security. I really hope that in the coming period, there will be an opportunity to talk more about our specific activities and the ways in which we have managed to make a significant impact in the field of the sector security. At the end, I would like to thank to the listeners for their attention and the organizer for their cooperation. I think that is a really good thing to leave some time for a possible discussion and questions and answers. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Sanja. It's coming out loud and clear for, from everyone here that we need more women involved and we need to mobilize broadly in order to address the, the issues. We're going 
to have the possibility, I hope, at the end for a Q&A session. So you can put some questions into the chat box if you have any. Uh, keep in mind though that we've got limited time, so I have to pick and choose a bit from the chat box, but feel free. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Josephine Alabi, the director of Keen and Care Initiative in Nigeria. And I know, Josephine, you are struggling a bit with um, the, the internet coverage, but please let us hear from you uh, the status and experience you have on gender-based violence in Nigeria. Please, the screen is yours. Um, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, please, can you can you make me make me come up on this on this screen? I have a, I have a problem. problem with the other one. Other one. Or do I go ahead? Do I go ahead? Sorry, Josephine. I struggle to hear you now. Okay. okay, I'm back now. I'm back now. Okay. I'm I'm back I'm, now. I'm back now. Um, thank you so um, much. Thank you so much. Let me start Let by, me start by, by thanking Isis, Isis uh, uh, Panda, Panda, Gensek, Gensek um, um, SDGs, and the all wonderful, wonderful team working behind the scene, working behind the scene to make that everything really going so really well. Going so well. Uh, let me start by uh, let me start by saying that the harvest effect of the harvest effect of conflict, conflict, conflict of impact on women, impact on women. And girls, and girls are much are harder, harder than, harder than those of males. Josephine, we are struggling with a bit of echo. Are you getting here. me? Are you getting me? We are getting you double, which is generally very good. I believe in amplifying okay. Okay. women voices, but we are struggling to hear you. So I suspect there's someone working. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Back to what I was trying to say, that there's an adverse effect of conflict impact on women and girls. And it's more harder on them than, than the male camp counterparts, counterparts. So I will say that there's a huge gap between the women or the female and the bill. So we need to look at that and address it. There's need for transparency and accountability in every process. There's need for gender mainstreaming. Issue of conflicts and different, different types of conflicts, you know, gender-based violence, you have the, those swans with the small high weapons and many more. We really need to look into that because you have community with, uh, community issues, you know, ethnic issue, ethical issues. You have the those of the farmers and the hard men. You know, you can just plant something, and then before you wake up, it's been taken up by uh, some others with animals. So there's a whole lot of things. Uh, we also need to talk about the issue of uh, the early marriage because the, the girl child are being forced to marry. And then the issue of um, there's need for feedback mechanism. And we need to make sure that things are actually in order rather than the way we have been seeing them. So we need to advocate more. There's need for data collection and, and analysis. So we need to take stock, stock of issues. And while we're talking about these small harms and light weapons is because some of them are being smuggled and they are used illegal. And, um, you know, women are being forced to be in refugee camps, IDPs, and uh, you find out that there's been a whole lot of issues going on and uh, which is not really good for women and children. Most times when anything happens, the men could flee 
and then the women are left behind because they are the one that has been exposed to risk. Uh, some are being raped, and um, there are lots of uh, issues going on that may not be properly addressed. So uh, there's a need for us to actually look at the issue of mediation. We need more women on the table. We need more women around the table. More women should be trained, and education is very crucial. So when we're talking about this, we need to address things proper, properly. So security and human rights is something that we need to really look at very well. Issue of disarmament, mobilization, rehabilitation, reinstation, reintegration of persons. We talk about amnesty. So how do we address this? How do we monitor? How do we evaluate? We need to prevent extreme violence. And uh, that's why we need to look at the issue of the small arms and light weapons very well, because men homes get more guns than women, you know, but women have been used in some cases, you know, just because they lack the knowledge. But this time around, we, there's a need for one to uh, put more push and then make sure that there's a need for the women to uh, learn and they are empowered in the right way. So there's need for gender mainstreaming. And um, there's also need for issue of the early warning system. Because before anything could happen anywhere, be in the community or anywhere, there's always things that should make us uh, know that, yeah, something is likely to happen. So there's need for information sharing. W women should also have more access to information. We women should be more trained. Now we are uh, the uh, COVID-19. So women should be also taught how to go about things than before. You know, there are some things that really need to be touched light. And then we really need to lay more emphasis on what the Security Council Resolution 1325 really say. So we need to advocate collectively and hand all forms of gender-based violence, promote peace, reaffirm, the important the role of women in prevention and resolution conflict, peace negotiation, peace building, you know, peacemaking and the humanitarian. You, there's a whole lot that we need to actually look at. Look, transformation approaches to stabilize or development. There's need to break the silence of culture of masculinity. Because you find out that when things happen, it's all about, look, it's that way it is. It's a man's world. No, we don't need that. And then we need to advocate to other stakeholders involved. You know, we need to talk. There's enough of the talk shop. We need to actually work. And then there's, uh, there's another thing I really need to talk about, the ATT, Amstrad Treaty. You know, we need to also talk about it. Because, okay, what is ATT? Okay, uh, let me just, uh, it's a multilateral treaty that regulates the international trade in conventional weapons. The, tra the treaty aims to reduce human suffering caused by illegal and irresponsible stability as uh, aims transfer, um, arms transfer, I mean, improve re regional security, stability as well as promote accountability and transparency by state parties concerning transfer of conventional harms. harms. So there's a need to address the huge gap on gender issues if we really must get things very right. All those things that we need to talk about the issue of the inconsistency of policies because we need to obey human rights. And uh, many more things that's really been said we really need to actually make sure that we make sure that everything sort of like um, happen. We necessary locations to advocate to. We need to make sure that we, we do that. All the necessary process involved, we need to like make sure that yes, things uh, must really work well. And let me just quickly remind us that that's why the fact that the way the women behave during the conflict, according to some reports, women remained drastically underrepresented in peace processes. Between 1992 and 2018, women constituted 13% of negotiators, 3% of mediators, and 
percent of signatories a major peace process tracked by the Council of Foreign Relations. However, studies indicate that women direct participation in peace negotiation has increased sustainability, sustainability and uh, quality of peace process. So what are we trying to say now? There's a need for more women around the table. Let's remove the issue of the masculinity. Let's do, let more women be educated and uh, part, uh, all the participation that is made for women, let more women be there. And then we shouldn't, uh, enough of the talk shop, we need to make sure that we enact things to law. And then if possible, the international community should make sure that countries that are signatory to certain things, rules, or maybe like laws or in everything, they should make sure that they follow it up. And if possible, if there's any possible things like sanctions or reminder, or maybe you want those ones that are make sure, um, working towards things, you have to like encourage them so that we can all be on the same page. Thank you very much. Josephine, thank you. Um, we are building women power here. I think it's a clear message from everyone. We need more women mobilized. We need better data collection. We need access to the tables. And we are not asking for it. We are demanding it actually. And we know that the challenges are enormous. We know that there's massive opposition out there, which we shouldn't overlook. We are very much aware of that from each of our respective countries and at the global level. Um, the challenge is enormous, the opposition enormous, but we also know and we have seen that building strong networks and organizations also builds power on our side. Now, with the knowledge of the opposition and the challenges, but also seeing the clear benefits and needs to have more women involved in disarmament and mobilizing for small arms control. I'm wondering if I can have all of you identifying the one issue the one issue, and I'm going to give you just sort of a one minute to answer. Uh, the one issue which is most important in order to get more women on board of the disarmament movement. What is the one issue to get more women on board? And my second and last question is, what is the one issue which makes, which is going to make it easier or more likely that we actually have women represented at the table. One issue for how to get more women involved and one answer to identifying what is the most important thing we can do to make sure that we get a seat at the table. Magda, I'm gonna give the floor to you first. Unfortunately, you have limited time. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It is a challenging issue that deserves a more extensive explanation, but given the time limitations, I can say uh, to significantly improve the participation and impact of women to stop gun violence, I think that we need to promote a cultural revolution. The patriarchal mode uh, model limits the development of both men, men and women so I think it's very important and in our best interest to confront this culture. Uh, we need awareness raising campaign to ensure that having guns at home, it's, uh, it, 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 is, it has to stop being normal, um, most for all for women. We need more also more women as role models in security fields, in legislation and public policy. And as I said before, to build alliances and networks and I also think that it, it would be very useful to train women to be agents of change, to develop local networks, to build peace, and to contribute to disarmament. That is also a good practice that has worked before, uh, because women working together, uh, as you said, it's very powerful, and we have uh, the, the power to change our local and our lo uh, um, more local 
um, policy. Thank you so much, Ilvand. I hand it over to you. There's little to be said after what Magda just ran us through. I mean, I think that's just the core of it. Hmm. We actually need to practice what we preach. These conversations that we're having right now, although you know, really, really great to see all these strong women working in this field, we need to stop preaching to the converted and start to also dominate these spaces that are still very patriarchal, very male-led. And that means that we'll be able to actually deconstruct the narrative that's plaguing women in this sector. We need to elevate global consciousness about the leadership and the role that women are taking at the front lines every day already right now and that aren't asking to be included. So, um, I mean, really, I, I think that Magda read, wrapped it up already without changing the narrative. There's very little that we can do and we can change the narrative through forums like this by profiling and highlighting women that are doing the work every single day um, by trusting women and giving them the leadership and direct involvement, you know, matching resources to the rhetoric. You know, not just celebrating that there are women that can do this work and are passionate about it, but actually investing in them so that they can lead it. And um, I would also say that, you know, there needs to be a more nuanced and broader understanding of the extent of the scope as well, too. So more research uh, that's actually led by women in the field. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Ilvad. Sandra? Okay, first of all, women has to be aware of the problem. And uh, for women like these women here at this panel uh, must not take violence and these gun issues like it's something normal. No, it's not normal. So women like us has to work on strengthening another woman's capacity to raise a voice and to fight. We have to find a way how to do that through trainings, through maybe the best thing we can do is to show our example and to show through our example how we fight against it, that it's possible and that women must stand up for, their, for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Josephine? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to say that that need for synergy building, if we must get there, there's also need for positive thinking you know, we don't need to look because I'm a girl, I'm a woman, then you are looking down on yourself. No, there's no need for shaming, but we need to like stay more focused. There's need for unity. There's need for solidarity building. There's need for exchange of ideas because what could be happening here could be a strength, but it could be weakness. So when you exchange ideas, we don't need to spend so much, but we can always... Um, build and uh, stop, help one another. So um, how to identify how to get more women on board is to keep advocating. We need to, because if we can get the first question you asked right, then the second one is going to be more cheaper because we're going to know the women who have already dreamed well in their various space. And then we can always uh, give them necessary information and uh, we need to advocate to key stakeholders. And then probably, be, uh, for instance, uh, when you are doing some things in communities, to some men, it's like you are brainwashing their women. So you can co op some men on board so that they can be more relaxed that look, what we're doing, we need to move forward. We mean business. Thank you. Thank you so much. And your points are also directly and indirectly responding to some of the questions in the Q&A field and chat box. We are running out of time. So let me just wrap up with a few words. Um, I think the main question I asked myself when I joined the launch of GenSAC, the Gender and Small Arms Network last year before the pandemic hit in Berlin, was why do women need to get involved in this? And I think the answers are very, very clear. And they come out loud and clear from the participants in this panel as well. One answer to why women should get involved is that 
the men that were involved up to now didn't do a too well a job at it. So we need more women and more people to be involved in disarmament and small arms control. The other, of course, is that women, well, we need more, that's my second point, we need more people involved. We need more people focusing on peace building disarmament and more people saying that small arms and arms is not an answer to anything. Point number three, violence is gendered. Women are affected in particular way that we don't even have, which has been highlighted by the panel here, enough information about and enough data about, which we need. Um, all in all, you who are sitting out there wondering how to get engaged and why you should get engaged, I'd like to summarize with reference to our fantastic panel. Um, we need you to get engaged. We need to build a movement to save lives, to save our sisters, to save our children, to build more resilient, sustainable societies. We need you all to get involved, get engaged, change the narratives, uh, take the space, demand the word, demand a seat around the table, build an organization, join a network, stretch out to sisters who need help, uh, educate your children, educate your neighbors, your friends and your communities, and let us build this movement together because we are going to be confronted with massive challenges. Uh, unemployment is going up, poverty levels are going up, and we know what spillovers, socioeconomic problems and inequality will also lead to. So we need to build a stronger movement and change the narrative. Now you are going to see our new action paper from GenSAC online uh, on the website of Pathfinders GenSAC and also on social media. So please go and check it, see how you can link up with the broader movement. We uh, also have a broad program with the SDG Global Festival of Action. So please check out what else is happening in the festival and highlight and focus the champions that we need in order to also go forward. With those last words, let me thank all of you that joined. Let me thank all of you who will be part of building this movement, focusing on disarmament and peace building as we go forward. And first and foremost, thanks to the great panel that we have here. And thanks for all the great work that you are doing on the ground. We will build formidable power with women power. Thank you so much, all of you. And have a fantastic day or evening. Thank you so much.